Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, our next guest is one of the greatest MCs there is. He's an activist. He's a family man. I think he's an inspiration. And if he ran for president with LP as his VP, they'd have my vote. Of course, I'm talking about Killer Mike, who's here to talk about his new show, Trigger Warning, streaming now on Netflix. In it, Mike explores a host of extremely relevant topics with his trademark irreverent style. Let's take a look. You may know me as Killer Mike. I'm a Grammy Award-winning rapper, and my ideas are often controversial. The greatest hindrance that black people have is white Jesus. I want to see a black savior. I hear you loud and clear. This... Will you lead my religion? You ain't gonna get me struck by lightning. I'm trying to introduce people to new thoughts and concepts. Killer Mike! I want to know how difficult it is to truly live in the black economy. No racism, but you're Asian. And I'm only spending money in the black community for the next three days, so you ain't black. I can go buy a Hell's Angel t-shirt. What do the Crips have a soda? The symbol feels a little bit more corporate. Yeah. No, I haven't worked with a gang before. This is a uh, first time for everything. There's simply no room for independent free thinkers anymore. It's time we started fresh. I would like to deem this place New Africa. Yeah. I need to produce educational pornography. Balls to the wall, put your nuts on the table. We can show the rest of the world that there's a brand new way and a brand new day. A kid was super mean to me. Word? Yeah, he said you're not like everybody else. You're one of Earth's original people. Hold on, man. Because if you jumped in front of him right now when I was telling him to be proud to be black, that'd be like the first lesson in white privilege he learns. And we don't want to oppress people right now. You got me? Word. Give it to me. Oh, that's an ally. Everybody, please put your hands together for the great Killer Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I believe I was gushing over you backstage. I <laughs> love you, man. I love your work. I love what you have to say. I think you're sort of one of the great speakers, one of the great voices right now in pop culture and, and in the world. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Um, this show is so much a part of that, right? It's yeah. so much a part of what you do as a musician and what you do as an activist, I think. Yeah. Everything is entwined with you. Yeah. So how did this come about? I know you work with the same director per episode, so. Yeah, Vikram. Uh, yeah. Vikram um, is amazing. I forget the name of his, um, his documentary, but essentially he, he, he um, cast himself as a religious leader from India. He got a lot of people to follow him. He had an amazing documentary about it. I'm, my mind's slipping right now. But yeah, w I wanted to go through the same director because I wanted someone who got the vision. Daniel Weidenfeld, who's a co-creator along with me and co-writer, Daniel and I have been friends. Daniel's you know, a short little Jewish guy from D.C., <laughs> big black guy from, you know, from Atlanta. We're his older brother and I are friends. And he and I just became best of party buddies and friends. And these are things and topics that I've had in my head and that he and I discussed time and time again. And we wanted to bring it to TV for about 10 years and finally got the opportunity to do so. And I hope you guys enjoy it when you check it out. It's streaming today uh, on Netflix. It right? is. It's, it is. Uh, it's so great. I'm like, I'm four episodes in. I want to talk specifically right now about the third episode where yeah. you work with uh, some gang members of yeah. the Crips and then, you know, eventually with... Cripacola, yeah. With Bloods also, yeah. And some Bloods as well. And the point that you make in that episode about uh, criminals, white criminals, always being celebrated yeah. in this culture, but never black criminals, them essentially being demonized, yeah. is so true and something that I yeah. never, I never, I'm yeah. obviously something that I never thought of before. And that's, but, and that's not me um, looking at the greater society or the larger America pointing, saying, you treat us unfairly. That's me saying to black people first, take advantage of your own criminality like yeah. other ethnic groups do. You know, um, every other ethnic group has a beginning story of criminality that set their family or set their group on the way to positivity. So when you talk about whiskey, you have to talk about the Irish, you have to talk about Joe Kennedy, Kennedy family. When you talk about bootlegging in the South, that led us to NASCAR, right? Mm -hmm. When you want to talk about coca production, cocaine, you talk about Coca-Cola. So my friend of mine who's a writer is in a restaurant in Chicago last night, and he sends me a picture of a huge picture of Al Capone in that restaurant. <clears throat> we have learned to make money off criminality as Americans because we like villains. We eat at Godfather Pizza, you know what I mean? We go to Grindhouse Burger. My community seems to be somehow ashamed of those things and not taking a part, not taking a part in capitalism, not being a part of capitalism and using that for the betterment of us all, right? Bumpy Johnson's should be a steakhouse. 
There should be a Bumpy Johnson Steakhouse where you can go get a great steak and you can celebrate the high times of Harlem because you can't separate Bumpy Johnson from the Harlem Renaissance and the greatness of Harlem and what it was because a lot of the civil rights marches were paid for by the numbers man yeah. and the bootlegger. You know, it wasn't just legitimate people. So if you don't take advantage of all of that, my thing is you're leaving <coughs> potential that, you're leaving energy that's potential behind. We have young men standing in front of stores smoking joints, talking trash, that are called gang members. Really, they're just members of street fraternities or a group of guys that like to wear the same cheesy clothing and stand together. You can take this potential energy, insert capitalism, and create commerce. And for those that say you can't, me and T.I. are both former drug dealers who now bought restaurant, a restaurant together, a 50-year-old restaurant that was closing, and we're going to turn that restaurant into not only a restaurant and jobs creator, in the spot it was, which was on Bankhead, where he lived, we're going to hopefully turn it into a regional franchise and national if we can. That's what selling drugs teaches you, the power of capitalism. doesn't mean selling drugs is right. It just means every other poor group has entered capitalism in that way, and we shouldn't be ashamed to do so also. So I take four members of the Crips, Gayo, AC, Murdo, and Nooney, on a journey to try to create a product to bring into a capitalist market so that we can begin to transition these guys out of a life of criminality and into a life of legitimacy and capital. Why do you think the, uh, the black community has been, I don't want to say they have, the black community specifically has been slow to adapt capitalism into, yeah. into this, but why do you think the Italians, the Irish, and everything else, have, it's celebrated so often? Well, I mean, it's celebrated because you should celebrate succeeding, you know, in, in overcoming poverty, and there's profit in it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's profit in black criminality for the bigger system, right? The 13th Amendment allows for slavery in the case of locking people up, right? So people get locked up, we use prison labor to cheapen products we buy, right? That's still an extension of slavery. Black people were brought here and made the cornerstone, essentially, and this ain't me going on a rant saying everybody owes, it just means America is a young country needing an economic head start in order to catch up with European countries, right? And in particular, the UK. The way they got that was free labor. Once that free labor was gotten, immigrants came here years later. So 1865, slavery is over. By the early 1900s, the Industrial Revolution is coming. You have a wave of European immigrants coming into America, and America starts to give them land. Now, this was the one thing that Dr. King started talking about. Well, one of the three things, along with you know, war and workers' rights. Before he was kind of expelled out of the public, known as his last two, three years of life, and killed, he talked about land lotteries, mm -hmm. about the granting of land and money to Europe, from European immigrants in the Midwest, and how African Americans and descendants of slaves deserve that same thing. And by us not getting it, it kept us handicapped. So in me celebrating the criminal or introducing capitalism into our community, I'm simply saying you've been disadvantaged, you've been taken advantage of, but because of the system we're in, we are in a system now where we can take advantage of not only our suffering, we could celebrate our wins and losses, and we can be the profiters of that. But I think you're also removing a certain amount of shame that's already been removed yeah, no from, other, be from other cultures yeah. who, have, who have had to engage in, crim in criminality for yeah. the purpose of... Uh, all my Italian friends have an uncle that was in the mob. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, and we all love Goodfellas. We absolutely, all, absolutely. We all love Italian mob absolutely, movies. Absolutely, you know? and absolutely. You go to a pizzeria, and it's got yeah. mafia people yeah. on the wall. Absolutely, or people absolutely. Who played mafia. absolutely. You don't really go into pizzerias or anywhere else and see, maybe you see Jay-Z on the wall or something. <laughs> exactly. You don't necessarily, you don't see anything else really. But, but, and Jay, what's great about Jay is he's a fine example of someone that we allowed. You know, we've given Jay permission to leave criminal culture, to take the things that he learned from there and turn into one of the greatest capitalists our community and our greater community has produced. I'd like to produce more Jay-Z's. I'd like to see that <clears throat> with this prison reform that's happening. I'd like to see the young men, or now old men, that are going to come home. I'd like to see them guaranteed a spot in the marijuana you know, world. Yeah. You know, it, it was essentially built on their backs, whether it was the trade routes that took marijuana through the country or the popularizing of it through music and through street culture. I'd like to see us do that back. The only way you get it back, though, is you lobby and advocate for it. And the only way you do that is to become proud of what you were and not ashamed of it. Cass, when did you <coughs> become an activist? Were at you always years old. at 15? Yeah, I, um, I've always been, but I think, you know, before 15, 15 is when I made my own decision. My grandmother was an activist, you know, and she, you know, she wasn't a radical yell out in the streets to everybody. She was just like, you do your part for your community. You vote, you go to neighborhood meetings. She marched in Selma, she marched in Birmingham. You know, she took me to mayoral campaigns for Andy Young. So many times I don't know what to do with myself, you know. So for, for me, it's what you're supposed to do as a member of your community. At 15 years old, the transit policemen were, were, had a really big beef with gang member friends of mine, right? My friends were Crips, were Kitchen Crips at the time, 
and they were gangster disciples. They had moved to Atlanta. You know, different people's parents had moved there. And they were just getting, you know, just pummeled by the cops. And it got to the point where kids and cops were going to be killing each other, right? So this is, you got to look at 1990, 1991. And I'll never forget us telling the mayor, Andy at that time, look, we want in. We want say in what's going on in Atlanta in terms of the goods and services for kids. I was with Andrew Young the other day, and he literally said, All right, I can remember you guys wanting to damn near kick in my door, mm. you know, and, and me having to respect you guys and help you put these forms together. But with the martyr cops, I remember sitting around a table and us as 15, 16, and 17 year old kids talking to and negotiating with these police officers saying, Hey, this is the problem. We may be lingering and loitering, but you guys are attacking us and violently. And what we're telling you is all of us are not going to accept it or be willing to sit at this table and negotiate with you. There are some other members, and they're going to be willing to push back. Now, my father had been a police. My, my, my cousins are police officers. So I don't want to see police officers die, because in Atlanta, you got to say, police officers look like me. And I didn't want to see my friends continue to be pummeled and beat and die. At that table, at that night, I can remember us brokering a deal that stopped those transit cops from beating up the gang members. And it also stopped the gang members amongst violence amongst gang members because they got a chance to sit together and negotiate on each other's behalf. I'll never forget Sergeant Shapiro told me after that meeting, you know, you communicated differently. He said, I appreciated everything everyone had to say, but because you knew people on both sides, you were the most effective person at that table because you weren't polarized as a police officer or just simply a person who's associated with these kids, and I appreciated you for that. And I never forgot Officer Shapiro for that. Your willingness to sort of understand both sides or to listen to both sides, which yeah. is a, kind of a cliche phrase at this point, <laughs> listen to both sides. I really, it's not, I'm not, I'm not the There are a lot of sides, of it. yeah. There are a lot of sides, but it's often gotten you, I would never say in trouble of any kind, but you have it's a con- trouble. You think so? Yeah, you have a contrary take sometimes. I think people assume that because you are a supporter of Bernie Sanders or something, yeah. you believe all everything under the umbrella nah. <laughs> that most supporters believe, but that's not necessarily the case when it comes to guns. I think maybe even when it comes to your association with, with police officers, yeah. with cops, yeah. being able to understand their yeah. side. Yeah, so my friends on the left don't, you know, um, don't like the fact necessarily that I'm very pro-Second Amendment. I don't think any group of people who've only been free for 55 years should give up a right to defend themselves. You can't tell me the president of the United States is a white nationalist and Nazi sympathizer and expect me to turn in my guns. That's just not smart, right? And the, 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 the other thing is, you know, my friends who are, who are anti-cop, you know, I, my father was a cop for a short time of his life. My cousins are currently cops. And I understand that we're in a culture where if you have to, if your mother is, is my sister got robbed, I called 911. You, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? That's what you're supposed to do. But, you know, on, on the flip side is, I can read and appreciate as much Milton Friedman as I can Noam Chomsky. I can understand perspectives from Thomas Sowell in the same way I can Cornel West. And if you can't do that, then you've been fed an opinion and you're simply a regurgitator of that opinion. You know, every human has subtle nuances, right? We all belong to these tribes, whatever ethnic groups we say and stuff, and we can't let a tribal mentality prevent us from connecting with other people on an individual level because the ambassadors from each tribe are the people who broker peace, essentially. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's important that I play chess standing up, looking down at the board, seeing the whole board, versus simply playing chess from my side, trying to win or beat the other side. What is the what is the Milton Friedman take that 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 you're an appreciation? I mean, he, I mean, you know, Milton Friedman is is, is it was totally free capitalism. Yeah. He, you know, in his mindset, um, mindset, it didn't take the federal government to end segregation as much as capitalism would have done that. You know, at one time, like if you needed an ironsmith during and shortly after slavery, you were hiring a black man. If you needed a woodworker, you were hiring us. If you, uh, the jockeys at the Kentucky Derby. So at one time, we were instrumental at industry in this country. And when our work wasn't free anymore, all of a sudden we became something that was unwanted and people didn't want. But your skills and labor were still needed, so you still stayed employed. When you began to enforce things from a federal government standpoint, you know, some people say that it went really well for us, some people say it went really bad for us. But I have to listen to all sides. I have to listen to Milton Friedman. I have to listen to Thomas Sowell. I have to listen to Noam Chomsky. I have to listen to Cornel West. Because it provides me with a wide enough spectrum to somewhere in the middle find the truth that works for me individually, for bigger works for my community, and if my community is strong financially, then the greater community becomes stronger, economically and financially. Now, the subjects that you talk about in the show, right, the first episode we see you are trying to, you're trying to sort of live specifically only off of yeah. black economy. Yeah. Uh, we see you working with the Crips. Oh, tell me about the subjects of the show. Yeah, um, I'm, I, I have the 
I have the ability to go on Facebook and I can go to um, websites and buy, I can buy criminal culture stuff from other people. Like I can buy a Bugsy, uh, you know, Bugsy Siegel t-shirt. I can buy an Al Capone t-shirt. I can buy um, a Pablo t-shirt. Right? I can buy a Hells Angels t-shirt. I cannot buy a Crip or Blood officially sanctioned t-shirt, yet Levi's will sell me a pair of jeans where on one side there's a red bandana, ironically enough on the right side where Bloods wear theirs, at the height of Lil Wayne's popularity, or on the left side, if they're selling the Snoops and the Levi's, Converse will sell me, you know, and it's, I don't have anything against these companies. If I was selling, I'd do it too. But you'll go in a Foot Locker in some cities, and one wall will be all blue shoes, and the other wall is red shoes, and you get to know pretty quickly, like, oh, they're marketing to the kids I know. Why can't these kids then market and create a product for themselves? You know, why can't we say to ourselves that the spirituality part of Christianity, Judaism, um, Islam are really good, but we don't like the part where we invade uh, indigenous people and we force our religion on them. Let's not do that part, right? When you start to suggest that deity should look like the people who are serving them and not the people who have oppressed them, that makes some people uncomfortable, but for the people who've been serving under a deity that doesn't look like them, it gives them the opportunity to see something divine within themselves. And I just, I've had these thoughts probably since fifth grade, and I just worked hard and hopefully put myself in a position to share them because I'm not trying to tell you what to do unless you're saying Black Friday. I'd like for you to find a black business to support every Friday, you know, because if those businesses grow stronger, they hire more than just black people, they service more than just black people, and it's good for local economies. I'd also like for you to sit around your coffee table and in your living room at home to talk, begin to discuss these things, and to come up with your own local solutions because if they work there, we may be able to import them to other places. How much of going into this show, how much was it about subverting sort of traditional ideas or things, status quo ideas that we just kind of take for granted on a daily basis? Well, it's all about that. This is, reality is not reality. This is just a shared imagination we agree upon, right? Buildings don't just pop out of the sky. They are not natural. If we didn't upkeep them and keep weeds from overgrowing it, you know, it looked like a Will Smith movie if we didn't take care of New York in a few days. It, the jungle would take over it again. So this is just something we agree on. We can progress our thinking quicker, and we can agree on more progression quicker, and we can change things quicker, you know, if we choose to do so. By not choosing to do so, though, we're only choosing safety over freedom, and that's never a good outcome. How much was it about not just pinpointing and subverting these, these status quo ideas, but also finding solutions and basing the episodes around kind of positive solutions? And well, it was about it because I, I don't know the answers. Like, I find out the answers on the journey. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I don't have the answer to unemployment. I never liked working. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> But I that's do, not true. You work your ass off. Yeah, I think but you're one but, of the hardest working showmen there is. Uh, yeah, but that's a job I love, so I've never considered it work. But man, when I worked at the Advanced Auto Parts, I was just in my car sleeping in the back, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I um, <laughs> I just I just want I, I well, as I go on these journeys, I learn more than I teach. Believe it or not, you know, I learn. I learned that my grandfather was right when my grandfather told me you know, post-desegregation, we're, we're worse off. I'm just like, what are you talking about, Pop? I go to graffitis, I dance with white kids, we're listening to George Michael, Faith, what are you saying? And he's like, you shouldn't be going to corporate drug stores. You shouldn't be going to corporate um, grocery stores. You should be going to Hunter Street grocery store. You should be buying produce fresh off the back of a truck of the vegetable man. And now as I've grown older and those things have dissipated mm -hmm. and now everything seems to be corporate, I'm understanding, wow, Burke was right. He was exactly right. Because now when the movement tells you um, to shop local or to do these things again, our grandparents were already doing those things. And for convenience, we gave up our ability to do those things, but we can reclaim that, and I think we should. When I say buy black, essentially because blacks don't own huge corporations yet, not, not a lot of them, essentially what I'm telling you is buy local, bank local, you know? Um, use your, get your produce local, get your, get your food sources locally, from the small restaurant, not the chain. So don't get offended that I say buy black, Go support a black business every Friday. Watch that business grow and appreciate you as a customer and help build a business that'll do the same in other communities. Yeah, uh, we have a question coming from Twitter. Let's take a look uh, at that question. Uh, the question is, it's from Kirsten Marilyn. Will you, <laughs> will you endorse Bernie Sanders for president in 2020? If not, is there someone else you believe in that you will put your weight behind? I, um, I, I'm a huge fan of Dow Revolution, which is currently being led by um, Ohio Senator, former Senator Nina, Nina Turner. 
She's amazing. I tried to disengage from politics, and she treated me like an auntie talking to a bad nephew and says, you're going to stay engaged. Why she, did you try to disengage? Because I was, I was disappointed in us as a country by not um, electing Bernie Sanders as our president versus Donald Trump. I think he's the only person that can beat Trump. I thought he was the only person that could beat Trump then, and I don't see anyone else who could beat Trump in 2020. If Bernie chooses to run, I'll be right there at his beck and if he wants me, and I'll be pushing as hard as I ever would. Um, unfortunately, though, it seems that Magneto has the Oval, Oval Office, and we're praying Professor X comes out of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think Bernie's the only one that has a chance to, to beat Trump? I think to put out fire, you need water. I think the only way you put out um, what you currently have in the White House is to have the exact antithesis of it. It's not to have a middle ground Democrat or a neoliberal. It's to have someone who is the direct opposite of it. You know, we talk about um, not that middle ground specifically, but the middle ground that you try to find both in conversations with other people yes. and the issues that you explore. Was that something that you felt or knew before you started working so much with LP? And, like, you two sort of, like, bridged both of your aesthetics, both yeah. culturally and musically? My friendship has helped it grow, but I already had white friends. I didn't have as many northern liberal friends. That's weird. You know, I'm a southerner. I'm a black guy, but I'm a southerner. You got to understand, you know, I enjoy fishing, hunting, fast cars, the absence of, you know, legal municipalities and government in my life. You know, <laughs> I, 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 li I have lived a lot like swamp people in my life. You know what I mean? My grandfather hated the fact you have a swift, had to have a fishing license. Why should you need a fishing license? You get hungry, God put fish here for you to eat. That was his philosophy. So learning that has helped me. Learning L as a person has helped me. But my grandmother, Betty Klontz, is really the person who taught me empathy and sympathy and forgiveness and how to progress. When they were sharecroppers before they owned their own land, the family that they worked for essentially had land, but they were a poor white family. And the husband could be pretty mean. You know, he called the girls boys, boys, he didn't care. He was just trying to get his land, you know, toiled. And the, the woman, the wife, I found a letter from her thanking my grandmother years later for my grandmother sending her money, visiting Tuskegee, providing resources for the woman because her children had moved out of Alabama and weren't taking very good care of their mother. And I told my grandmother, you've told me all these stories it's just about how brutal they were to you and just like mean or just how they hurt your feelings. Why in the world are you helping this? Like, you know, I was really on a tyrant. You know, you're 15, 16, you're all pro-black. And, and she said, they didn't know any better because they weren't taught any better. And if I'm taught better, it's my responsibility to be better. Hmm. She had in her life found empathy and sympathy and the ability to teach someone who had been mean and had oppressed simply based on race that transformed not only her as a human, but the other person. This lady wrote like a four or five page letter apologizing for her behavior and saying the same thing my grandmother reiterated, reiterated to me. I didn't know any better. I didn't understand <laughs> how wrongly we were taught. I didn't see the beauty and the brilliance until I got older and I understood now. And you're the only person. My grandmother was just a saint, you know. <clears throat> and from what I hear, I'm sorry, okay. from what I hear, when she was younger, she was mean as a rattlesnake. <laughs> you know what I mean? So to see how she progressed in her life gives me the encouragement that the people that I'm conversing with, if we can manage to get people on a one-on-one -on -one level to work with one another, to converse with one another with people who don't look like them, who don't believe as they do, if we can get those interpersonal relationships going, we start to fix the bigger problems because we get off our team and we start to individually judge people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin or the class they're from. I'm curious, you know, we talk about teams, this current team that's in the White House and this current conservative movement, if you can really call it that, whatever, Whatever this hell nightmare seems to be. I'm just kind of curious if oftentimes they like to try to pull people into their fold who they think may have a crack in their beliefs or they think may in some way be able to be um, pulled in. And if you're talking about the Second Amendment and if you're talking about finding the middle ground, have you ever been reached out to by any of these people or have any of these people tried to be like, oh, Mike, you're one of us, like, come, come be on our team? Yeah, I don't think that you sometimes. are, but I do it, it think happens. that they, it happens. they try know. to do this. Um, it happens, you know, people. Um, I mean, I saw him co-op Kanye West, you know, yeah. which is, you know, I don't believe his intentions were that, but it got co-opted. I don't, I just refuse to be co-opted. Like, yeah. my thing is, I'm, by either, by either team, you know no, what I mean? No. I think I'm not going to be co-opted by Trump or, the, you know, I didn't get co-opted by the Clinton team, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, my, and that's not a slight on any one of them. That's just simply saying, if it's not good for me as an individual, if it's not good for my community, in the greater community, I'm just not going to comply. I don't think Americans should give up their right to bear arms. You can't say that we have Hitler in office and then say, hey, 
let's give Hitler our guns. Right. It, 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 it makes no common sense, right? So I don't believe that. I do believe that we should have Medicare for all. So even though I'm rich and it's going to make my taxes come up, it's worth it to know that if one of your mothers or fathers gets cancer or needs oxygen or has diabetes, that the money that I'm putting into the federal government versus starting another war will help to take care of you and your parents. So I just, I just, <laughs> sorry. I just, I just try to pick individual things that I know I can affect on a local level that may affect things nationally or not, and I try to get behind those things and be a mobilizer and organizer. The stuff I can't or the stuff that's not on my agenda, I simply don't worry about. So I don't take, I don't, I'm not giving my orders by the news every day. I'm not giving my agenda by a political party. I simply take stock of my life every morning. I try my best to be a good father and husband and a community advocate and, and leader. And I, and I encourage others to do the same. If you stand for Medicare for All on this stage, you get an immediate round of applause. Well, I do stand for Medicare yeah. for All. I, I, I have friends who are in Canada and Europe, and they've somehow managed to become millionaires, too. And yeah, it doesn't they, make any sense. Yeah, like, I have friends in Canada, and they all, I mean, you hear someone like Ted Cruz say, Canadians are coming to the States. And then you, you talk to your Canadian friends, like, no, we're no, not. No, we're not. My health care is amazing. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, right, exactly. My, one of my um, security got, got sick while we were in Europe and had to have a, have it have a tooth fixed, you know what I mean? And you know, luckily one of the homies that was over there in Europe was just like, you're gonna go see my dentist. Officially this is gonna be my tooth. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that saved my homie. Otherwise, man, he would have just been over there bad. I just I think that we could in this country there is a way to have compassionate capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not saying be a sucker and give all your money away. But there's a way to exercise capitalism with the compassion that will take care of people, that will allow them to live out their days with dignity. And I'd like to support that. And Sanders is the beginning of that push, you know. Um, Sanders is the beginning of the recreational or, you know, when he said if he became president, one of the first things he'd do would decriminalize um, marijuana by taking it off the Schedule One list. I don't think if he did that, you would see marijuana decriminalized in Atlanta like it is. Uh, there are so or, many or, doors that he opened. Absolutely. And, and he needs to be given credit for that because uh, yeah. nationally you can say, you know, you didn't like what he did, or if you lived in a state, you can say, well, he didn't do it when he was in a state. But he caused a conversation that's made it happen. It's like, um, it's like who? It's like Moses. Like, he got you to the mountaintop, but it took someone else to take you down into the valley, into the promised land. Yeah, yeah. and we see someone like Ocasio-Cortez doing that as well right yeah, now, just absolutely. sort of fighting the good fight. Maybe she doesn't get the laws passed herself, but the conversation starts. And that's all trigger warning is about, mm -hmm. you know, having this conversation. I want you guys to watch this show, and I want you guys to converse and have lively argument besides the two perspectives you're given every day. Yeah. I think we have time for a few audience questions. Uh, what do we got here? Right here. Hi. Hello. Hey. Uh, my name is Jacques Nopal. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hey, Jacques. How are you? Doing good, man. Um, I wanted, You said something very important uh, that hit me about we choose safety over freedom. Yeah. And being that I'm from uh, Louisiana and seeing what I see in my community, uh, that really hit me. Uh, what, do you, what, what, what do you think could help spark a change in that mindset in a world where black people have been redlined and shut off economically and don't even, and you know, for a long time, not even allowed to really get small business loans. Go home today, get a styrofoam cup, get some, get some um, dirt and grow a tomato plant. That way you can feed yourself. You can't be free if you can't feed yourself. You know, I thought freedom was when I went fishing with my grandpa or when I went hunting with my uncle. You know, we caught fish or killed deer, you know, and killed meat. And I thought freedom was putting that meat in the freezer. And then the men got to sit around all winter and say, I, that meat is from me. But the freedom was really in my grandmother's, you know, who was cleaning and preparing the fish and storing it. The freedom was in her gardening and us helping our minister garden. My sister picked up all the garden skills. You know, I feed my family for one year off a deer. My sister feeds seven families with her garden. You know, do for yourself. Bank locally. So when I say bank black, that means find the banks that locally either are owned by blacks or that treat you well as a community and bank with them. Support businesses that look like you or that are small or in your community that hire you. <clears throat> My definition of a black business is three things. It's either owned and operated by black people. It's either owned and operated by other people that hire black people that treat black people with fair and dignity and pay them a good wage. Or it's a business that owns and it's ran by people, but it's fair to the community. You know? So I just say do those things. Grow your own food, take care of yourself, support the things that support you, and take care of yourself as an individual first. Be selfish with yourself. Next question. 
Hi, I want to know what was the most difficult part in putting together the show, and I want to know: Is there any people in the hip hop industry that have come to support you with this, and do they join the the show at any point? Um, T Pain actually appears. He pops up on one of the episodes. He helps me. He helps me sort some stuff out. The entertainment community in Atlanta has been very supportive. They came out to the premiere. They help it with resources. If called Chaka Zulu, Kenny Burns has come out. You know, Ti and Big Boy, friends of mine, have both put it out. Um, and Atlanta as a community, period, has been helpful. It's been a 10-year um, labor of love putting this together with me and Daniel Wadifield. We tried several different ways. Some of them worked. Some of them didn't turn out good. You know, but it, I just say, man, you know, my greatest talent has been just showing back up even after I get knocked on my butt. Just getting back up, dusting myself off, trying again. And that's what got the show on the air finally. I, th I feel like Atlanta really got on the show, got the show on the air for you as well. I mean, watching I you see. interact with Atlanta yeah. and people in Atlanta is just like a heartwarming, beautiful thing. Yeah. They love you and they know you, and yeah. it, the feeling seems mutual. It's it not is. like watching Bill Maher go out and. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I like you know, Maher. He's no, fun. I'm not. I'm not. Not yeah. to knock Nar, yeah. Maher or anything, but he's not really a member of the communities that yeah. he that, yeah, he's that, that he approaches. Like you are. Very much a member of this community. Yeah, I have a Michael Moore style. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm chubby and cuddly, so people are disarmed <laughs> by that. And, you know, it's, it's easy for me. Bill, you know, Bill is, Bill is slick. So, you know, yeah, people, Bill, <laughs> Bill I like slick elites. I like yeah. Bill a lot. I like him a lot. Uh, I think we have one, time for one more question. How you doing? Um, my name is Markel. Um, I'm a big fan of all your music as Thank well. You, um, uh, I noticed, like in your conversation and within your lyrics, um, you're very fearless. Like you're not afraid to have that conversation or say certain things or whatever comes to mind. Or dumb. Um, huh? Or I'm, or I'm just dumb. Or no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but in like sort of in our um, our society now. Um, you know, there's sort of that fear of, you know, having certain conversations yeah. with certain people that yeah. may not be, be on the other side of it. And, you know, we all kind of, from yeah. social media, we're all in our, like, own little silos. Yeah. Or, like, teams or tribes, like you said. So how do you, how, how do you feel we can get to a level like you where we can be fearless in having that conversation on both sides? I, well, as, as, a, as a greater community, right, we have to agree that the First Amendment is pretty rock solid. You know, you, I want the right and freedom of speech for the person I don't agree with as much as I do for the person I do agree with. And when you wake up and you think, and that's your thought pattern every day. Like when I read Chomsky, Chomsky tells you freedom of speech is for the person who's your adversary as much as for you. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe in freedom of speech, right? I have to believe in George Wallace's freedom of speech as vehemently as I do, do Martin Luther King. I believe as vehemently our president has freedom of speech as I do for all the opposition he has because I need to hear honestly what you're thinking in order to honestly engage you. Not change you, not beat you, not defeat you, but engage you. So first I'm seeking simply to engage you. And if I engage you, I have to do that on a ground where it's safe for us to speak to one another. So I encourage you to not only make it safe for people you agree with to speak, but you have to make it safe for people you don't agree with to speak also. Thank you. How does that pertain, in your opinion, to platforms, though? Should people be deplatformed if they're using hate speech? Um, are we turning into the scarlet letter? Are we turning into mobs? Look at, go home or Google when you leave here, lynch mobs. Google lynchings. You're going to see black bodies deformed, hanging from trees, crooked necks. And I need you to know, these were the people in their towns that were outspoken. The people that are hanging were the people who were pushing back. And look at all the normal, regular people around them. Mm -hmm. Children, moms, dads, the people who were clergy in those towns are looking at that spectacle. They're looking at that person hung. Now, I'm not saying these purple, the, the, the people that were in the audience all were evil and bad, but they were complacent and compliant with it. We are becoming that. Um, they were often I, celebrating the lynch. Yeah. They were part of the town, yeah. like a town celebration at the yeah. time. It feels like sometimes it feels like we're doing the same. I'm not saying people who do bad things don't deserve to be punished because we have a system of punishment to punish them. I am saying that I'm not sure if just because I don't agree with you, I should destroy your life and career. Mm.
Yeah. Uh, you know, one more question. I love Run the Jewels so much, Thank man. You. I've seen you guys three times. Like, it's one of the great, I think, live shows. Thank there's you so it's much. It's just two guys. That means the world to us. Thank you. And, and a DJ. Shouts out to Frank And a DJ, Star. excuse me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and what, one of the great things about it is your two personalities bouncing off of each other yeah. and the fact that you are able to mix your activism, your sincerity, as well as your sarcasm and, as you said, stupidity yeah, all absolutely. together in one seamlessly. Yeah. Was that an organic thing that just you, the two of you found when you played together? Or yeah. have you found that you are kind of honing how these things nah, go together? Nah, it's me and L. We're friends. I mean, you, now you, you do more. It's like anything else. You do more of what you're good at. You do less of what you're not good at, right? So, you know, the, if, if talking too much is too much on stage, you know to talk less and rap and dance more, you know? So you figure it out organically as you go along. But what you see with me and L on and off stage, that's us. You're, you're seeing in Run the Jewels, what you're witnessing is not a rap group as much as two adult men who are secretly getting to live as 15-year-old boys. And genuinely love yeah. each other. Yeah, I love yeah. them to death. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, when I saw you guys at Panorama, you brought your families out. Yeah. And it was moving. Yeah. And you were just sort of saying, hey, we're in New York, and we want everyone to absolutely. meet our family. Absolutely. And you were hugging. And it was one of the sweetest things I'd Thank ever you. seen. I think Thank I was you. tearing up when I Thank saw it. Thank God. So nice. <laughs> and there's a, no, a number of other groups that Sia played after you, and LCD Sounds has played that. But we walked away being like, run the jewels, run the jewels. Yeah, I cry a lot. I'm the crier in the group. You know. Do you really? <laughs> Absolutely. That's so nice to hear. Yeah, I'm the guy that gets emotional and hugs Elle and cry with tears <laughs> in my eyes. So, yeah. Oh, uh, Mike, this has been a, an honor to talk to you. Thank you for Trigger having Warning me. is on uh, Netflix right now. Yep. Go watch it. It's not just smart and poignant. It's also really funny. Yep. And like he said, he's like a teddy bear. You can't help but love it while you're watching it. Killer Mike, everybody. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate y'all having me here.